Hi, this is Ethan Alter, senior writer at Yahoo Entertainment. I'm sitting here today with Yardley Smith, star of so many things, The Simpsons, <laughs> Maximum Overdrive, and now a podcasting superstar for the podcast Small Time Dicks. It's a true crime podcast. New episodes drop every Friday. It's currently in season six right yes. now. Season six just launched. Great. So tell us a little bit about how you got interested in starting the true crime podcast. Um, it's actually Small Town Dicks. Right. Um, and we, I, I just... I have a thing, but I like the good guys to win. So I, and I have this theory that if, if there are people out there who are not interested in following the rules that the rest of us follow in order for society to function well, I also want to know that there's another group of people out there, law enforcement, who are willing to go forward and put that train back on the tracks. So um, I was actually in 2014, I was a guest uh, at a Simpsons event mm -hmm in um, Detective Dan's small town. And he was my security detail from the local PD. And uh, we hit it off. And um, then we sort of started texting and then writing and then we started dating. Now he still lived a <laughs> thousand miles away. So uh, for two and a half years, I flew up there about every other weekend. Mm -hmm. And of course, his identical twin brother, Detective Dave. So on the podcast, it's me, Detective Dan, and Detective Dave. Right. And um, we are the anchors of the podcast. And all of our cases are told by the detective who investigated the case. So Detective Dan and Dave always tell us a couple of cases a season. But um, then we always have guest detectives from other small towns as well. Mm -hmm. um, so. But when I would go up and visit Dan, and Dave would come over, of course, and they would just download their day, and I would sit on the couch and just say nothing and listen to them talk about their any old Wednesday. And I'm telling you, their any old Wednesday was so much more extraordinary and harrowing and like, what, <laughs> than my any, any day ever that... Um, Certainly, you know, flash forward, you go, oh, yes, that should be a podcast. But I, you know, I had a, a co host in the beginning of the series, and we were all together, and it just was sort of one of those ideas that just was like, oh, that seems like a good idea. And we're, a, we're sort of an anomaly in the podcast space these days because we're independently owned. Paperclip, my right. production company, produces the podcast. So there's Wondery and there's Parcast, and they're all now all these companies that go, hey, wait a second, this is actually a good thing. We should all have a podcast. And so um, <clears throat> and so we're unique in that regard. Right. So it's great. It's great. I mean, I love it. For me, it's really whatever your podcast is about, the podcast is the frame and the people are the picture, right? Mm -hmm. So whether your podcast is about food, whether it's about crime, whether it's comedy, it's all the same frame. And then what's the picture? Right. So. Listening to the first two episodes of this season, uh, the, the second episode's all about a shooting at a, it's someone not wanting to move out of their apartment, and then there's a shooting that follows. And the first one delves into uh, the o opioid crisis. There's there's an angle and an element of that in the first episode. Yes. I, I think what's so interesting about the, the podcast is in addition to being about these crimes, it's also a real window into just life in small towns now, and what life is like and the social and cultural forces that are at play there, which is yes. really interesting. You know, for... I think one of the things that surprised me when I would hang out with Dan and, and if he was, if we were someplace outside of his small town, mm -hmm. um, people would, and they found out that he was a detective in a small town, they'd be like, oh, what do you do, like rescue cats and stuff? <laughs> and you're like, what? No. And the truth is that big time crime is happening in small towns everywhere mm -hmm. and with the same level of depravity and reckless disregard for human life as it is in big cities, but with less frequency is all. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that these smaller agencies, so if you are in there, in Dan and Dave's small town, there are nine detectives in that detective pool. Mm -hmm. How many in New York, New York City, right? Thousands. Mm -hmm. So two things. One, they never really fade back into their environment because Every corner they pass, they're like, oh, yeah, I arrested a guy on that. Oh, yeah, there was an accident on that. Oh, yeah, there was a, a robbery there. Oh, there, you know, the town is small. You probably know half the people you've arrested. Um, you also wear multiple hats. So you're a detective, but you're also on the SWAT team. You're also expected to produce the same high level of work product as a big city cop, but with many fewer resources. And so it doesn't mean that your job is... Harder, it's just different. It's just right. a different puzzle piece. And I don't think 
you know, those are, those are the kind of details that um, a lot of our fans are quite surprised by. But I think some of the best compliments we get are from other law enforcement personnel mm -hmm. who write to us and say, this is amazing and thank you for telling the story from, you know, soup to nuts. We right. don't, they don't get a lot of that. And, and while there is also a really important and worthy conversation about some of the bad actors in law enforcement, Small Town Dicks is often about the men and women in law enforcement are, who are consider their job a calling mm -hmm. and doing really extraordinary and exceptional work because that's an, the other side of the conversation. And so I think there's room in the world for both. Right. And your role in the show is interesting because you're both, uh, you're, you're an avid true crime fan, but you also are sort of push, helping move the narrative along. So you're asking really important questions to get the detectives to recall details and things. How do you sort of, has your role changed since you started doing the podcast, do you think, from the early episodes to now? Um, I would say in the beginning, I probably talked too much. <laughs> and Dan and Dave said, you and, and Zibby was my co-host in the beginning as well. And he, they basically said to us, you guys need to sort of zip it. Because what law enforcement does when they tell these stories, it's almost like testifying for them. Right. So you just have to just let them talk. Now, the flip side of that is I and in, in the beginning always would, if I don't understand something, I'm never shy about saying, what does that mean? If it's an acronym or... Um, you know, what's an Alford plea, or why, why is it that way? And if you are the person who is going to encounter the worst of humanity every single day, because that's your job, where does that live inside of you? If you, and you? If you have a family, and even if you don't, where do you put that? Because that is a very distinct and, and specific kind of personality, you know? And so for me, that story never gets old, even if it's the same story. And the story is often, we just put it in a box. Oh, but by the way, the lock on the box isn't that good. So eventually, all of that stuff, if you don't deal with it, it will deal with you. And I just, I'm like, uh, and then what, right? right. And so it's, it's um, to, 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 to sort of have that be your calling and to stay in it for, say, 25 years so that you can get your pension and, and um, have some sort of retirement or something is, it's, it's, it's kind of extraordinary, I think. Because literally these are the things that people are like, oh no, I don't want any part of that, right? And then you have these men and women going, okay, now I'm gonna go in. Yeah, I'm gonna take care of that. Thank God for that. Thank God. At the end of the second episode, when they talk about the season, where they talk about the the shooting with the, with with, with the uh, man who wouldn't leave his apartment, yeah. and shot a cop. You sound at the end of it very worn out and exhausted. Like it's clearly made an impact on you listening to this. Do you? Is it hard for you to 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 put the stories away when you're done? Do they haunt you when the when the recording is over? Um, they they do. Um, yes, I actually. I always. I always wonder about the people who are left behind. Mm -hmm. You know, you wonder about the man, for instance, who gets shot in that episode. What about his family? What is, what is that like right. for them? And in our podcast, we change all the names of everybody. We change the names of the suspects and the victims, and we don't actually tell you where the crime took place. But um, it's still it's still so uh, visceral because again, you know, I think what's hopefully what's unique about these stories, first of all, they're not stories that you've often heard yeah. in true crime because it's such a popular subject in the podcast world and on television too. Like there's this whole <laughs> network dedicated just to true crime, right? right? A couple of them actually. Um, you get a lot of the stories told over and over again. And um, so one of the things that we are really quite proud of is that these are often stories that are not often heard, that you haven't heard a lot of. Um, once in a while we'll do a, a story that is uh, well known, for instance we did the Thurston School shooting mm -hmm. and we did that because, and we told you it was Thurston, um, because it has a certain historical significance which was that the, those students who shot up Columbine High School studied that, studied that crime, right. studied that tape. 
and then said, oh, we're going to do these things differently. I mean, that's just chilling and awful and, and um, extraordinary, and a lot of people don't know that, actually. You know, they think that school shootings really started with Columbine, but in fact, law enforcement considers it having started much earlier than that. So, in any case, um, yes, you, I, I hear these stories and I'm always, we usually try to get uh, uh, several stories in a weekend, you know, we go mm -hmm. to a small town and we get six stories in a weekend if we can with different detectives. Um, and it's exhausting. Right. It is exhausting. And then in the editing process, much like the detectives, you kind of switch it to the other side of your brain because I edit on paper and then mm. we have two editors who put it actually into Pro Tools. And you s and it just becomes a little bit more analytical. You're lis I listen for different things. Um, and so I'm not listening so much like an audience member. I'm listening to make sure that if you are doing something else while you're listening to a podcast, which you probably are, mm -hmm. driving, walking the dog, cooking, gardening, talking to your wife, your husband, your child, whatever, I want to know that you can still follow the story, and if you, and if you missed something, that you're still interested enough to go back and go. I don't want to miss that. Right. So that's my job. The most important minute is the next minute. Hmm. For people who <laughs> haven't had a chance to listen to uh, the show or are looking to get into it, what, what's an episode you recommend them starting with? Oh gosh. Oh, it's oh that you can't ask me that, Ethan. <laughs> it's too hard. Um, Gosh, uh, well, there's, um, okay, well, Zero Hour is a great one, mm -hmm. Ten Below is a great one, Don't Go, our very first episode mm -hmm. is fantastic, um, uh, Interstate is great, uh, Girl for Rent, I mean, really, they're all pretty remarkable, and we actually, the, the other piece of Small Town Dicks is that we, just last year launched a Patreon mm. page, right? It's, it really is only, it's $5 a month, which is pretty cheap. You know, in Patreon, you can have various tiers. We just have one. But what, what I love about our Patreon, actually, is that the content there is quite different. Mm -hmm. It's um, a little more conversational. It's a little looser. It's often quite funny. Right. There's also, we have a lot of audio assets as part of our um, main episodes, so we'll file file uh, Freedom, Freedom of Information Act uh, forms for uh, 911 calls, suspect interviews, things like that, and insert those into the episode. And so, but sometimes you'll get the extended interview, you know, on Patreon or, um, but you also get great little sidebar conversations mm -hmm. with the detectives or Dan and Dave on Patreon that are just funny and silly. And so if you're going to have something like that, it's good to curate content that is different from your main feed if right. anybody's out there thinking of podcasting and doing the both things. <laughs> so. Be a patron. Don't I'm donate. Saying, yes. <laughs> donate know, to that small too. I mean, Jump it helps in. us go to small towns around the country, <laughs> right. you know, and get more stories. Um, if you're going to have a, a highly curated, heavily edited um, mm -hmm. podcast because we're, you know, our, our storytellers are fantastic, but I wanted a podcast that was really clean. I wanted it right. to be th like This American Life. I, wa I didn't want a lot of people talking over each other, and so that takes some doing sometimes. And so it, the podcasting can be, I recorded it on my iPhone, I push publish, and you can find it on iTunes, right. or it's, uh, it can be a little spendier. So. <laughs> a little bit more of a professional <laughs> organization. <just> <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that's what we do. Professional armchair detective, yeah, yeah, I yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about some Simpsons talk. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the show uh, celebrated its 30th anniversary last year, 1989. Yes. It was when it premiered, and it continues into this year because the show itself started in 1990, the first episode That's started right. airing. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Actually, the very first half-hour episode was, well, the Christmas episode in 1989. Right. But yep. then you're right. The, the rest of the half-hour episodes, because we were mid-season replacement in January, started in 1990. In 1990, and I yeah. definitely remember I watched it back when it first started airing. It was one of those shows that like is so seminal to so many people, kids yeah. who grew up in the 90s. Crazy. And, and, and the, the 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 episode that really sort of locked Lisa Simpson, the character uh, you play right here, into focus <laughs> was um, uh, the sixth episode, which was all about Bleeding Gums Murphy and oh. Moaning Lisa, which yes. was really the first Lisa-centric episode. Uh, I watched it again recently. 
recently. It was so interesting. I don't think I realized it at the time, but the way it deals with young de kid depression yes. is kind of amazing. Yes. You and very honestly, and yet in a really funny way. It was really again at the time. I don't think I appreciated it, but now I really can looking yeah. back at that. It was uh, apparently uh, James L. Brooks, who's our executive producer, yeah. um, one of them. It was his idea, and he wanted to do an episode about Lisa Simpson being sad, mm -hmm. and it it sort of it certainly had never been done before as sort of as a cartoon right. and in a primetime cartoon, and um, I gather it wasn't altogether. Um, everybody's favorite idea for an episode, but Al Jean and Mike Reese were charged. They were our showrunners at the time. They were saddled with writing this, and mm -hmm. they did such a beautiful job. And of course, it's one of our most memorable, iconic episodes over the entire series. Right. And it's because it's just, it's so simple. Yeah. And everybody, of course, has been there. And I think in many ways it was, Lisa Simpson is so, She's so vulnerable yeah. as a little person, you know, that um, even if you're, even, even if you don't, even if that's not a place that you necessarily go in the, in the world, even if that's not a place that you're comfortable, it's certainly a place that you have experienced internally. Right. Is that the episode where you feel Lisa sort of found her voice, for lack of a better word, as a, as a character to you? Is that really what yes, she Yes, probably. Yeah. Um, I remember when we went from Tracy Ullman to the half hour shows that Jim Brooks said, I want Lisa to be um, a prodigy, like a saxophone prodigy. Mm -hmm. I also want her to be, you know, super smart, like Mensa smart. And, um, because prior to that, she really was just a foil for Bart. You right. know, I don't, I don't think she was as much a misfit in her family as she became when we went to half hour episodes. Yeah. And, um, and that had a lot to do with him. This uh, October is the 30th anniversary of the Treehouse of Horror. Uh, oh, episode. Yes. the first one aired, and I remember right. when that aired. And I, I, I get made fun of sometimes. I, I interviewed Al Jean once when the last anniversary for that uh, episode came around, and I sort of told him, I confessed, I, that episode scared me as a kid when it was first on. I found it really scary. He was like, <laughs> you did? Really? But, like, I mean, you, you, it seems like you agree. That, ep that first episode, unlike some of the it others, was dark. is really scary. You yeah. know, we, we um, that was one with Quoth the Raven, right? Right. And... Um, it was, yes, it was sort of a parody of horror, but it was much edgier than the current tree houses of horror that we do. And so I totally get that. You know, they really, yeah, they, they went to the mat and the animation was so beautiful. I mean, and those episodes still to this day, we now will record a Halloween episode a year in advance right. because it takes so long to animate because none of the backgrounds are the same. Mm -hmm. None of the characters wear the same clothes. So w one of the benefits of Lisa Simpson always wearing her little red strapless dress <laughs> is Lisa Simpson always wears her little red strapless <laughs> dress, right? <laughs> and that, you know, we're often in our house or in the school and those backgrounds are the same. But as right. soon as... We do we do those funny trilogies, you know, that aren't Treehouse, but right. where we're in biblical times or something like that. Um, those are really complicated for the animators, and I think they're like, "Yay, rats!" <laughs> you know, it's kind of. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the second story in that one is a lot of fun. It's the, the Twilight Zone to serve man riff, and Lisa's the one who figures out the Kang and Kodos plot, and that's the very first Kang and Kodos appearance, oh, too. And they're yes. much scarier in that one. There's more drool and things. <laughs> and then, and I think, you know, Harry Shearer and Dan Castellaneta do Kang and Kodos, and, and I believe they've swapped. Mm. So one used to do Kang and the other Kodos, and now vice versa. And um, and and that happens, and also Rod and Todd. Right. That's happened with Rod and Todd Flanders, <laughs> and um, it, it happens. And I don't actually know how it happens because I feel like they're pretty meticulous note takers in that writers' room. But somehow it happened, and I think it just happened with a like a new showrunner and. Right. I don't, it's like a bad game of telephone for somebody who's, <laughs> who does that? I don't know. And then all of a sudden, like, Whoa. and then the whole just train just came off the track. <laughs>
ship's going down. <laughs> <laughs> when you first read that that uh, to serve man episode, was it fun that Lisa gets to be the one to figure it out? That she's the one who's like, oh no, they're going to. I don't remember do this. it. I'm going to break your heart and tell you I do not remember. You've done so many. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember. I remember the parody of Edgar Allan Poe. And what's the third one in that? It's first? a murder house. Uh, everyone they move into a, a murder house and they spend the night oh. there. And there's a spirit. There's a scene. The scene that got me as a kid was when they're all walking around in a circle carrying knives. Oh. And they're and they're just pursuing each other and yeah they're, 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 that's the scene that, that I remember scary. being scared yeah exactly yeah, right okay good I'm not yeah. alone no that's good <laughs> go us <laughs> we're wimps <laughs> and we admit to it <laughs> <laughs> the the other uh, fun 30th anniversary thing or uh, uh, somewhat fun it, it was 30 years ago uh, that Barbara Bush made her first comments about the Simpsons being the dumbest thing she'd ever seen yes it was, <laughs> yes yeah. and I. Um, do these uh, little, um, often on my social media, I'll do uh, Simpsons Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I'll do a little two minute video about something behind the scenes on right. The Simpsons. And so I did a video about this letter, right. this comment that Barbara Bush made. And did you know then that Marge Simpson wrote to Barbara Bush yep, yep. and said, I hear you think my family is dumb and I'm <laughs> deeply offended. And Barbara Bush wrote back. Right. And it's so brilliant. And so I covered both of those things, both of those letters. And I thought, good for you, Barbara Bush. Like, way to go. Right. That is classy. I mean, yeah. You go, girl. So good. Was was it weird being thrust into the spotlight like that at the time? I mean, you're doing, you're voicing this show. I know it wasn't written to you directly, but it still was sort of caught up in that moment of suddenly you were being called out by the First Lady of the United it's, States. Uh, I mean, I think we sort of, I think it was a proud moment, mm -hmm. you know. I think even though, even though it was sort of derogatory, even though she, she wasn't like, hooray, because, you know, her husband wasn't a fan of The Simpsons either, right. said we need a lot more shows like The Waltons and less like The Simpsons. Um, so I think we sort of wore it like a badge of honor, you know. <laughs> And as, as you can see, that because the writers wrote back as Marge Simpson, and right. then, like I said, hats off to you, madam, for writing us back as well. <laughs> Did they uh, solicit any advice from the cast about what to write and what to put oh, in the no. letter? Or? No. Heavens no. <laughs> they, don't, they don't require that sort of input from us. <laughs> <laughs> when you got to do the, uh, the the Bush episode where the Bushes move in next door to the Simpsons, yeah. was that was that a fun little bit of payback or just or, it's or just fun, fun on payback? <laughs> you know, I think on our show the mandate "take no prisoners" really right. is they really take that to heart. Um, in as far as we've made so much fun of Rupert Murdoch when the Simpsons was still owned by Fox, right. we've made so much fun of Disney now owned by Disney. Um, and so we were at D23 this last summer, which is Disney's big sort of Comic-Con, or it's, it's a little more polished than Comic-Con. It's a little more <laughs> fantasy forward, how, how to say. It's a little sort of, a little more fairy dust right. than uh, Comic-Con. Um, and I moderated the Simpsons panel at that festival. And um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the question as I was trying to <laughs> dig myself out of a Disney hole. Do, oh, oh, yeah, right. yeah, so we put together, we compiled this um, clip show, a little clip reel of all the times we'd made fun mm -hmm. of Disney, and um, which, you know, ha again, hats off to them for letting us then play it for the audience. Right. We did have to run it by them before um, we just <laughs> sort of showed it to 5,000 people, but... Uh, they were like, yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, they also seem to have a sense of humor about themselves. So, I mean, I guess if you're going to buy our show and then publicize it as much as they have for right. Disney+, Plus, then you know what you're getting. You, you better like it or you're going to have a lot of buyer's remorse. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you need to know. Because you know what? It's over 700 episodes, so <laughs> you're going to have a lot of stuff on a dusty shelf. Right, exactly. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> 
you, you were in the uh, or Lisa was in the news a little recently when uh, there was and, and you responded by tweet when uh, William Barr, the Attorney General, oh. tweeted out the the after Nancy Pelosi tore up uh, Trump's speech at the State of the Union, Barr uh, tweeted out a picture of Lisa tearing up her speech from that episode where she goes to Washington. Yes. And you responded to him. What yes. was that exchange like when you saw that whole cr that all um, crop up? Well, I was teed up by a senator from New Jersey mm -hmm. who said, I bet Yardley Smith has something to say about this. Meanwhile, he'd written something already really piffy and witty, and I was like, I don't really need to add to this. But then I saw the meme that William Barr had co-opted, as I said, in my tweet, and then used some unsavory language as well. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think that, first of all, I honestly thought it would just go under the radar. You know, the internet is like drinking from a fire hose. So I just thought it would be sort of like through the slipstream, nobody would pay any attention, but it really kind of went around the world um, and got picked up by all kinds of news agencies. And so here's, the, here's the, I, here was my thing. My thing was, Yes, look, it's everything has become so divisive and, and partisan these days, but no matter what side of the aisle you land on, whether you're for President Trump or not, you should be upset that a little girl, whether she is a two-dimensional cartoon character that many of us regard as being more human than most three-dimensional human beings or not, is destroyed, that there there is no fairness and democracy is dead. Right. That should upset you, and you should not use that to troll your fellow, you know, cabinet member. You should you should not do that. Right. You're you shouldn't do it. So that was my point. Like, yeah. do not use my character to fight your fight. Right. Fight your own fight. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So, um, and I was I was not. Um, yeah, I was mad. I was really mad. I was just right. mad. Like, dude, dude, listen to me. First of all, you don't even watch our show, so you don't get to. Like, you don't get to use my character to fight your fight. <laughs> I'm sure you don't watch our show. Um, so, yeah, I was pretty pissed. Right. Like, don't mess with Lisa Simpson. Just don't do it. It's true. <laughs> Especially when you get the episode wrong, as many yes. pointed out. Like, like the well, misinterpreting. Right. Yeah, right? Exactly. You, yeah. And that, uh, yeah. <laughs> you don't even know what you're referencing. Right. You don't. <laughs> so, yeah. You probably can't swear on your show, but I would, I, there would just be a, just a, like a litany of expletives right here, right here, Ethan. <laughs> we'll do it off camera. It's okay. okay. We'll let okay, it go. Good. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I mean, and that brought up, uh, in response to that tweet, a lot of people were posting images when Lisa Simpson was, when we had President Lisa Simpson. Yes. And she followed President Trump in the office. And yes. so, that, so that that was, and I still love that that's, that's her future, or one future for her is that she ends up in the Oval Office. It's I agree. A, I feel like she and Elizabeth Warren would get along. They have a similar I... taste in pantsuits. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and there, you know, there have been hashtags of uh, Lisa Simpson for president. I'm all, I'm all for it because, mm -hmm. you know, she'd have a staff of 26 writers behind her <laughs> to solve all the problems of the world. That's as it should be. It's when they start to say Yardley Smith for president, I'm like, no, 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 that's not what you mean, not what you mean. Right. You want little Lisa Simpson to be president, and I'll, I'll voice her if you, if you need me to. <laughs> I'm behind this. Let's make this. <laughs> let's make this happen. <laughs> we got till November. We can. We, we can. Make, we can. We can we, run. This. We have a minute. <laughs> <laughs> One other news story that, that that's cropped up recently: uh, it, um, Hank Azaria has has said he's he's stepping back from voicing Apu. Was that yes. something that he discussed with you, with the cast, or was it a decision he sort of arrived at? Did he, when he made that decision, did he come um, to talk to you about it? No, I I mean I know Hank personally. We've been friends for a long time because we were on Herman's Head together, right. and I adore Hank, and um, I know that he takes he has taken the the decision really seriously. And um, he really, really wanted to end up on the right side of the argument that, and do something that he personally could live with and be proud of. And you know, he has a son, and that he could say, you know, I started out this way, and then I thought, you know what? I think I need to change course, and I'm going to end up over here on this side of this situation here. And so. Um, and Hank took a lot of heat over mm -hmm. the last couple of years for um, that whole debate. And as he says, you know, and we all really love Apu, and of course Apu was 
we, we meant no harm, but that doesn't mean you didn't cause any harm. And so I think everybody respects his decision and um, we're also, we're always enormously sad that um, things didn't end up the way we wanted them to when their, our intentions were really the best, right. right? And so, but I support him completely and I, I don't think the producers um, know what they're gonna do with Apu yet, right. but um, Hank is so talented and luckily he does, does like 149 other characters. Right. <laughs> so there won't, be, there won't be any dearth of Hank. Like, right. But um, you know, I always thought Apu was, he was so smart mm -hmm. and he was, he has such a big heart. Um, I personally will miss him, but I also fully understand how we ended up where we are, so. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, some characters have been retired when the voices pass away or, or yes. something like that, but ho there's the hope that maybe there's a way to find, bring him back yes. in some way, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, let's talk about, uh, this is one I've been waiting to get to, Maximum Overdrive. Okay. Uh, as, as, a, as a fan I of 80s horror movies, that's definitely high on the list as, as the only movie that Stephen King directed. Yes. That, that he adapted. And he's famously said that he does not remember directing <laughs> Maximum Overdrive. He's been on the record saying he does not remember doing it for a variety of reasons. So I guess my question to you has to be, what do you remember about Stephen King directing Maximum Overdrive? So he was, could not have been nicer. Okay. He was lovely as can be. Um, I think, and he was incredibly humble, mm -hmm. you know, and was sort of the first to admit that he didn't have any idea what he was doing. He was also saddled with an all Italian crew, mm -hmm. meaning they literally didn't speak English. It wasn't like, oh, we're, you know, we're super accomplished Italian Americans all fluent in English. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying because the executive producer was Dino De Laurentiis. Right. They were Italian and we had a language barrier here, people. So <laughs> we had a translator on set who would say to Stephen, what would you like to do? And then mm -hmm. Stephen would say, um, okay, maybe I think I want to do this. And then the guy would translate to the Italian crew and the Italian crew would discuss it, say to the translator and the translator would, I mean, we must have added on a week and a half just in shooting time just for translation alone I mean it was chaos and plus it was about 140 degrees down in uh, Wilmington North Carolina right. where the studio was um, and we did a lot of night shoots and I think one of the reasons Stephen says he doesn't remember is because it was at the height of his alcoholism right right, and his drug addiction, which I didn't know. Um, but I do remember that despite, no matter what, no mm -hmm. matter what the schedule was, if it was a night shoot, the beer would come out at five o'clock and <laughs> he would just start drinking. Right. And I was like, okay, all right, anyway. I mean, let's go. <laughs> Uh, in retrospect, maybe not the best decision. Um, and I remember, I've told this story a couple of times, but there's that scene where the Cadillac drives through the, the wall of the truck stop. And I'm standing there and I'm like, Curtis, is that car gonna like drive through the wall like the thing? By the way, worst Southern accent ever. Like, where is that girl from? Anyway, anyway, was she an army brat? Did she just move all over the South or what? Um, so no supervision whatsoever. So they said, okay, Yardley, we only have, you're gonna do it. You're gonna do the stunt. You're gonna stand there and you cannot move until we say go because we only have one shot at this. They had, I think they had built that truck stop. I think it was an abandoned gas station and then they built the structure because they were gonna destroy it, of course. And um, I said, okay, you know, I was 22, I think at the time. And, um, and they said, and don't worry, because you know, it's gonna come. It's, it looks. It's gonna look like on screen is coming so fast. It's gonna go so slow. It's gonna be so fine. I'm like, okay. So I'm standing there, and you know, okay, roll them. Okay, action. That thing, that car came so fast, so fast, and I am like, you have got to be kidding me. That scream is so real. So real, and I'm thinking, and about when are you gonna tell me to move? I'm, it felt like an hour. Oh and so finally, they're like, move! And I leap out of the way, and I, like, I leap into sort of, there were booths, you know, in the truck stop, 
And I and they're like, great, great. And I have glass in my hair, you know. I mean, it was not legal, I'm sure, <laughs> at all. Like, no hazard pay, no nothing. And it just was, uh, that's the kind of shoot it was. That's the kind yeah. of shoot And when well. we crawl through the drainage ditch, it's an yes. actual <laughs> drainage ditch that's not in a studio. They're right. like, you don't mind, right? You just, like... It's a little mud, you know, you know okay. like who knows what's in there, good God. Gosh, I mean, I probably have a tapeworm still from that, who knows. So it was a, it was an adventure. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. What but was he it? was nice. Yeah, <laughs> he was He's nice. nice. And he, yeah, he, you know, him. drinking at five, it's yeah, a, it yeah. makes you put you in a good frame of mind, yeah. usually. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's keep like sort of the danger. There's a scene where you uh, they, they fire a uh, bazooka at a at, at, a, at yes. a truck that's right behind you, and you all have to jump to the ground yes. at that moment. Yes, so I remember that. That, that looks too. like a non-stunt person. You yes. were actually jumping yes. in that. Yes, that's yeah. true too. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was that scene like? Were, were you? Yeah, were, it was hot. Okay. I remember really hot, and uh, I remember it was super loud. And I, I also remember there were a lot of things that didn't work. Mm. You know, so those trucks, they were they were old, they had bought yeah. them, so but they were like jalopies, right? Mm -hmm. So and then they rigged them so it looked like they were self driving and all right. this thing. But half the time they wouldn't work. <laughs> so then there'd be delays because you couldn't get that thing to work. And then, you know, so I feel like with that with the rocket launcher that, ah, oh, oh, rats, didn't work, oh. back to one, you know, it just was, and dusty, yeah. I've never been so dirty in all my life, I mean, just, and like I said, it was a billion degrees in, right. in North Carolina, in the, because in the, it was uh, sort of August, September, right. as I recall, that we shot it, uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if this was something that you brought to it, but I love that Connie, basically her arc in the movie seems to be her constantly getting mad at Curtis, whatever Curtis, because yes. Curtis wants to be Emilio Estevez. That's the thing. And you were just always yelling at him, what are you doing? Yes. Was that your idea? Was that something that you, or was no, that in the script? I feel like that's um, a, sort of an archetype of Stephen King mm. female characters often. Right. Meanwhile, this that whole film is based on a 12-page short story. Right. So, which... I don't know. That just seems like a not great idea to begin with, that we're going to try to stretch 12 pages into an hour and a half or more. And for me, I would say the real problem with the film is maybe not even that so much is that we broke our own rule. So mm. the rule is that this comet passes through the atmosphere and then right. all of the electronics, the mechanical things go haywire and kill people and you can't trust them right. except for the things that we really need right <laughs> like we all end up getting on this sailboat but the sailboat right. has a motor right it's because yep. it's that big of a boat <laughs> so you're like what I'm, what I'm sorry what so you can't do that you just can't right and there were things I think in the truck stop in the building itself that ended up n that didn't go haywire so I just th think I don't know. Right. I mean, there are probably other problems too, but that seemed big. That was the big that one. That seems like a problem, <laughs> like a big thing that you weren't going to get by the audience, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> well, I, and my last question that I'm going to have to ask, at the end of the movie, I'll always remember this, Connie's the only one with who doesn't get a gun. Like, everyone else gets a gun. Even the kid, even the young kid gets a gun. Did, did you want a gun? Was that, was, was that, was, was that something that, that you asked for, didn't get? Why doesn't she have a gun at the end? That's a good question. Again, I think that was... Um, you know, a, a sort of a Stephen King, I, I haven't, I feel like his early books, there were kind of, um, some of his female characters were kind of these stereotypes, and I feel like, he, I do feel like he wrote them that way mm -hmm. as a kind of sort of subversive social commentary. Right. Not that he thought women were that way, but that this was a way that women were being portrayed. Now, right. some people might say, well, it was so subtle, nobody got it, and therefore it was not successful, right? <laughs> um, but I always felt that that's what that was. Right. So I wasn't ever really offended by it. But, you know, that was my uh, third movie. I had done Heaven Help Us, Legend of Billie Jean, and right. then I did um, Maximum Overdrive. And 
I, you know, I was sort of back to law enforcement. I was such a rule follower. If I wasn't offered a gun, I wasn't going to ask for a gun. <laughs> I was, I was the, um, I show up 100% prepared. Mm -hmm. I am always exactly where I need to be. I don't rock the boat. Uh, I try to bring something extra to the role. Um, but I'm not a, you know, I was thinking about this. <laughs> right. Why don't we do this yeah, here? Yeah, <laughs> I'm just, uh, if I'm going to think about this, I'm going to bring that to the part, and then if you don't like it, you're going to tell me you're going to dial that back, right. or we're going to go this way, right? <laughs> but, uh, y yeah, I don't, I don't recall having a, an issue with that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a funny, that's a really interesting and astute observation. <laughs> it just jumped out on this view. I was like, wait a minute. Wait like, a no, minute. That's not fair. Not What's even gonna... a little, you right, know, exactly. Saturday Night Special. <laughs> not even a 38. Or even like, hey, kid, give me your gun. <laughs> like, you're, you're only 12. Yeah, you're you can't 12. use it. You shouldn't be hell? using this anyway. That ain't right. <laughs> <laughs> were, were there other horror movies you turned down after Maximum Overdrive? Like, was that because you could have gone in that in that? Oh, I guess path, I could have. Sure. Like, um, were there any that came up? Nope. I did do. Um, I did do a terrible production of Journey to the Center of the Earth. Mm. After that, where I played a creature under the earth. Again, such a cheap production <laughs> that usually when you have prosthetic makeup, I guess they put you in a dentist chair right. because it takes so long. So you kind of are, you're sort of supine, right? You're prone so that they, even if you fall asleep, they're like, you're still. And No, I was literally in a metal folding chair, yeah. not even kidding. <laughs> and it would be four hours and, you know, my head would drop. <laughs> Makeup artists be like, Yardley, good God, you got to keep your head up so I can put this on you because you're killing me. And I'm right. like, I'm sorry. I was, <laughs> sorry. I mean, and it was awful. And I had to make up my own language. And I was, that was tough. And then I think it only came out on video. And mm. I'm actually not even sure I'm in it. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. It was After brutal. all that. It was br <laughs> oh, brutal. Brutal. Yeah. <laughs> terrible. That was where any, I think by then my, um, I think, I think was Her Herman's head maybe was over by then. Mm. And there was this period of time, so the first 12 years of my career was super successful, really. Mm. And I had, and I, by then I had The Simpsons, and thank God. And then, but then my on-camera career really started to sort of die off. Mm -hmm. It really started to slow down. And I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know what to make of it. And I, it was, in some ways, I think, because I had been so successful at the beginning, mm. and I didn't, hadn't had any, um, acting lessons, I, I was sort of like this great big house with no foundation. <laughs> so I didn't have, I sort of like, I didn't have any resources. Right. I didn't, I, I was really adrift and, and I was also not quick to fix it. I didn't, at that time, you know, the, it was just many things. I think the business was changing and I think you sort of, it was starting to become necessary to be a multi-hyphenate. So right. actor, writer, director, some version of that. And I was like, I don't want to do that. I'm the actor who goes to the audition and gets the job. Can't I just do that? <laughs> and essentially the answer was no. Right. But it took me years to catch on. And so I kind of dug my heels in and didn't serve me. Mm. So children, as a cautionary tale, don't do that. <laughs> be a little bit more nimble and adaptive. <laughs> but then years later, you get your own podcast, so that works out, That's too. Right. It all comes around. That's right. <laughs> let's, let's end on Spot Town Dicks again. I mean, what, 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 is, what is your, I'm sure you get this question a lot, but what is your favorite true crime story? If you had to, if you had to pick one, just, just, just a, a, a case that you're always fascinated by. In, like, in the general? Yeah, in the like general, in the any, big, big? Any, any, true, any, oh. any true crime, classic crime. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, gosh. Well, oh, gosh, that's a good question. Well, I really, um, I will say I was pretty, I'm always fascinated by crimes where it seems like the pieces are so scattered so far and wide mm -hmm. that nobody will ever be able to put them together to form the picture. Right. So um, Bear Brook is a really phenomenal podcast where th that was the case, mm -hmm. where they we're like, well, we have a body over here, and then we have body over here, and then, and it was years, and then they finally, finally, finally assembled all of the pieces, and they went, oh, shit, you know, it was like this thing. Um, so that kind of thing is really, um, 
fascinating to me. I don't like unsolved mysteries. Mm -hmm. I really don't. I don't, um, and I don't feel like, oh, I could figure that out. I don't feel that way. <laughs> I'm not that. Um, so I, I really like resolution. I want it for the families. I want it for myself. I want it so that the good guys win. Right. That's what I want. Right. So something like the Black Dahlia mystery or something like that yes. is just sort of frustrating. Yes, like, right. but have you heard Root of Evil? No, no, I haven't listened it's to that. fascinating. Okay, okay. So the family of, uh, the Hodel family, right, right did... Um, the granddaughters of George Hodel, who mm -hmm. is suspected to be the Black Dahlia murderer, um, do this podcast, and his, their uncle, who is the, the detective who wrote, who's the son of George Hodel, who wrote those two books, um, it's pretty compelling, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, well, like Jack the Ripper. Right. Who's that? <laughs> I don't like that. Who's that? Who's that guy? Um, I am currently listening to, um, it's called Unheard, the Fred and Rose West tapes. Mm. Boy, again, there's just a string of expletives that follow <laughs> these people. These, they're British serial killers. Just go, what? What? I, mm, no, no. <laughs> Not okay. Um, and so, yeah, but I love, I really am so... We've, we've actually, on our podcast, we've had Paul Holes on several times. Mm -hmm. And Paul Holes, of course, became really well known for leading the team that solved the Golden State Killer case. Right. And that, of course, you know, 30 years of crimes up and down the state of California with clues and pieces everywhere. And to be able to bring that together into a picture where you go, mm, yep, that right. seems pretty viable is extraordinary to me. Yeah. So I, I'm really, can't get enough. Hmm. Can't get enough of the good guys winning. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what you insist on with your podcast. Every, every episode has to have a resolution. Um, we so. just, uh, y well, yes, although, so we insist that the cases be adjudicated. Right. Because we often have detectives who are still working. Hmm. We don't ever, you know, they often can't comment on a case that's... Sure you know, still in flux. But we did do a case, there's actually a case called, um, uh, what did we call it? We called it, uh, er, oh, I can't remember. He's, uh, anyway, he's wrongfully convicted, mm -hmm. right? Him and this mm -hmm. other guy, wrongfully, wrongfully convicted, put in prison mm -hmm. for eight years. Then the next season, we have an interview with one of those oh, wow. suspects who was wrongfully convicted. Right. And we asked him, like, what, what was that like? And, like, where does that experience reside inside of you? And interestingly, he sort of says, everything happens the way it's supposed to. You know, I'm not glad that it happened, right. but I don't have any bitterness. You know, they, once they figured it out, they really did work hard to right the wrong. Yeah. And, um, it's, you just kind of like, I mean, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Uh, hmm. So, yeah. I feel like you need to, the, the next step is Netflix series. We get like, you know, we, yes. we, we get you guys right, I'm right. Not, I'm hosting a Netflix series, you know, <laughs> telling these stories. I'm in. Reenactments. I'm in. Let's do it. Let's do it. But not cheesy reenactments. Right. No, 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 no. No, Definitely. really good. <laughs> really good right? reenactments. Really classy reenactments. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Small Town Dicks is on a uh, podcast that you can download from any podcast server now. Uh, new episodes drop on Friday. It's in season six. Uh, Simpsons is airing in season 31 right now, going to season 32. Yes. And Maximum Overdrive is available everywhere that you can stream. That's very good. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much to Yardley Smith for coming in today. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thanks.